Welcome back to This Week in Video Games, and this is the News Roundup, giving you all the latest video game news you need to know in just about 10 minutes. So if you find this useful, don't forget to like, share and subscribe on YouTube, and also your favourite podcast apps. Links down below in the description or the show notes. Well, it's the 7th of November 2021, so let's get into the news. Well, first of all today, Elden Rings, we had 15 minutes of gameplay, and it showcases the open world traversal boss fights, and more. So this one comes from Wesley LeBlanc out of Game Informer. So From Software has released 15 minutes of Elden Ring gameplay, and it features some of the open world traversal in the land between, souls-like combat and a healthy amount of death, and a look at some dungeons that await players within. The entire showcase heavily emphasises player choice when navigating the world of Elden Ring, so unlike previous From Software games, which are more akin to wide open interconnected areas rather than a full open world, Elden Ring's world is completely open, allowing players to tackle objectives how they see fit. Or maybe open the gate to proceed through the castle, or perhaps you're worried about a secret archer who might snipe you down there when you walk through the gates, so you take the side route instead. The choice is seemingly yours, and that seems to be a running theme throughout Elden Ring. Do what you want, when you want it. Now, that's not to say that Elden Ring will allow you to do that easily. Something tells us the game will have its own way of telling players, no, not yet, but only time will tell for now. In fact, Elden Ring has a guiding light that seems to nudge players in a suggested direction, but as the gameplay showcase narrator notes, players don't have to choose to follow it. Choosing not to follow it might pit players against massive fire-breathing dragons that drop from the sky out of nowhere, And we also got a look at some of the many NPCs that we're going to run into in the land between, including the Iron Fist, a.k.a. Big Pot Boy. That's an NPC that appears to be a large pot with arms. In perhaps the most surprising reveal in the video, From Software showcase Elden Ring's map, which is new to the From Software formula. And players can even set beacons that act as waypoints to help navigate the land between. We also get a new look at the Spirits of Elden Ring, which appear to be summonable allies, as well as online co-op gameplay. So here we're treated to some of the more secure-like stealth that could be used to skulk around the world. Elsewhere in the video, we witness a fight between the playable character and the massive hulking boss that wields a golden axe featured heavily in Elden Ring marketing so far. And that boss appears to be no joke either. It has multiple phases, fire magic, massive leap attacks and more. And it's safe to say that we're shaking in our armoured boots, just thinking about having to fight this boss when Elden Ring is released on February the 25th, 2022. Well, next up in the news today, I've got more Elden Ring news. So Elden Ring has a 4K graphic mode and 60 FPS performance mode on PS5 and Xbox Series S and X. This one comes from Wesley in Paul out of Eurogamer. So Elden Ring has a 4K graphic mode and a 60 FPS performance mode on PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series S and X, and confirmation comes from a GameStop listing for the Elden Ring Collector's Edition, which includes a paragraph title, Enhanced Experience. And the paragraph goes on to say, Using the power of new generation consoles, PlayStation 5 will allow players to personalise their experience by choosing between graphic mode in order to enhance the game visuals up to 4K, or performance mode for a higher frame rate up to 60 FPS. It's the same wording on the Xbox Series S and X listing for the Elden Ring Collector's Edition. This is the first From Software game to offer console players the option to prioritise visuals or frame rate and is sure to go down well with fans. Of course, the wording of the retailer listing mentions up to 4K and up to 60 FPS and Digital Foundry, I'm sure, will deliver the real-world results when Elden Ring comes out. So loads of exciting news there about Elden Ring, and I really, really can't wait for this one to come out in February 2022. But next up in the news today, we've got 343 Industries Details Halo Infinite Battle Pass system, including how to switch between them and how it's going to work. This one comes from Wesley LeBlanc out of Game Informer. 343 Industries has released new information about the Halo Infinite Battle Pass system, including how players will be able to switch between passes. So in a new interview with IGN, Infinite Head of Design Jerry Hook and Lead Progression Designer Chris Blom discussed how the game's approach to Battle Pass will work in the free-to-play multiplayer. And they said it's aimed at keeping all kinds of players returning to it. We wanted to be able to say, hey, look, when you put your 10 bucks in, you get to keep that 10 bucks, Hook's told IGN. 
That's alluding to the fact that the battle passes in Infinite never expire, meaning if you don't finish a given battle pass before its associated season is up, you can still work on it in the next season. According to Hook and Blom, though, you'll only be able to work on a single battle pass at any one time, so if you're working on the prior season's battle pass, you won't be able to advance at all to the current one, so however the current one will always be available for you when you're ready to tackle it. So players will be able to switch back and forth between battle passes at will, so which rewards you earn and when you reward them is really up to you. So if you buy a $10 battle pass, it's yours to work on forever. And another thing IGN learned is that the battle pass seen in the recent multiplayer technical preview is not representative of what we're going to see in Infinite this December. Plus, IGN reports that about every quarter of the battle pass will have a legendary cosmetic in it, and that the legendary rated cosmetics will be character cannon related, or a new type of customization object with special attributes or effects. Well, next up in the news today, Final Fantasy XIV's director blames my own selfishness for Endwalker expansion two-week delay. This one comes from Wesley and Paul, out of Eurogamer. So Square Enix has delayed Final Fantasy XIV's Endwalker expansion by two weeks. And in a note to players, producer and director Naoki Yoshida apologised for the delay which sees the hotly anticipated expansion pushed back from its original 23rd of November release date to the 7th of December. I am truly sorry, Yoshida said, and early access to Endwalker now begins on the 3rd of December before the launch proper on the 7th of December. And patch 6.0.1 comes out on the 21st of December, and patch 6.0.5 is scheduled for release on the 4th of January. Yoshida said it was his own selfishness that caused the delay. So the biggest factor behind the release date change was my own selfishness as the game's director, he admitted. Ever since I was placed in charge of the original Final Fantasy XIV, I've continued the development and operations for Final Fantasy XIV over the past 11 years while always endeavouring to balance my position as the producer overseeing the project and the director in charge of development. And it was my intention to work in the same manner as we approach the final stages of Endwalker's development and as I have previously mentioned in interviews and during live streams, Endwalker will be the largest expansion pack in the history of Final Fantasy XIV. It has been a huge undertaking, but we proceeded with the development following plans that would allow us to make it in time for the original scheduled release date, although admittedly, everything would be right down to the wire. However, as we neared the end of development and I played through everything, from quests to battle content and the like, I just couldn't contain my desire to further improve Endwalker's quality, specifically because this expansion pack marks the first major culmination of events in Final Fantasy XIV so far. And even as we look beyond Endwalker, the Final Fantasy XIV story will continue for a long time and we hope to deliver many more enjoyable experiences in the game. However, it was precisely because Endwalker concludes the first major saga that I felt our team needed to push ourselves to the limits that I envisioned. As a result, we remain firmly resolved to adjust down to the smallest nuances and ensure our writing covers even the finest points of the vast and intricate story that has spanned these past 11 years since the original Final Fantasy XIV to ensure that everyone can fully enjoy their adventure in Endwalker. Well, unfortunately, the consequence of this is that we ended up in a situation where we'd cut into the time required for the final quality assurance checks due to this time spent on additional improvements. At this rate, there was a bigger risk of us reaching the release date without ensuring stability and one form of quality, and for that reason, I decided to postpone the release at this time. As we also anticipate large amounts of congestion across all game worlds, I felt that even in this respect it wouldn't be right for us to release the expansion whilst lacking adequate stability. I am truly, truly sorry. So when I look at my own career, up until now I'd never postponed a previously announced release date, although I did once shift a release from spring to early summer, and when, considered that for many players that already made arrangements such as taking days off work in preparation for the original release, I was incredibly torn between whether or not we should cut down the expansion pack's volume or even release the content in installments. As such, I humbly ask you to forgive me for all the decisions I've made. Yoshida said he's confident that Endwalker will now be up to scratch when it comes out next month. So once more, I'd like to convey my sincerest apologies for the inconvenience caused to our players and colleagues due to my own shortcomings, Yoshida added. I sincerely apologise for this decision. We will continue to do our utmost to bring you the best experience, not only in Endwalker, also through further updates and content that will follow, restoring your trust one step at a time. 
Well, reading that report there, I do feel a little bit sorry for Yoshida. You know, I know Final Fantasy XIV fans are going to be a little bit disappointed, but really, if the game's not ready, it just has to be postponed. And to be honest, all of these apologies are just for a minor two-week delay. Well, that is it for the news today, and thank you so much for watching or listening, and for more video game news content like this. Like, subscribe, and share with a friend. To join our community, check out the Discord link in the description. And you can follow me on Twitter at TWIVG Podcast. This Week in Video Games is also a patron, and you can find out more on patreon.com forward slash This Week in Video Games. We can sign up for awards like early access to the podcast, get your name in the credits of videos as well as exclusive content, special Discord roles, and community features too. Check out the links down below in the description or the show notes for more information. Well, thanks again. I'll see you soon.